Welcome, welcome, welcome. I hope you're as excited as I am. It's Wireless Tuesday. Wireless Tuesday is a monthly podcast that revolves around Cisco Wireless LAN and related technologies. It's a way for me and my colleagues on the Cisco Global Wireless team to give back to the community that's given us so much. My name is Jason Grant, and I'm your host. Let's get it going. It's Wireless Tuesday. Hey, we're coming at you from the Customer Experience Center in the Singapore office. I have with me a very special guest, Mark Krischer, who's going to go over some uh, really exciting RF fundamental topics. Uh, if you were at Cisco Live Melbourne, uh, please don't give it away. Uh, but uh, if you weren't there, then good news. Uh, we have a, a, a version or variant of that uh, presentation that was done. Um, Mark, uh, a couple of questions before we get started. Sure. Can you tell us a little bit more about um, who you are, what you do for Cisco, and uh, kind of how long you've been here? Uh, so I came into Cisco through the Radiata acquisition. So uh, back in 2001, we got acquired by Cisco. We did the first 802.11a chipset, small Australian company, uh, which I was a part of, despite my accent. Um, and uh, that's how I came into, uh, into Cisco originally in the uh, business unit side and then moved into the sales side. So I'm now uh, the wireless evangelist and technology lead for, uh, for wireless across Asia Pacific and Japan. And a Cisco Live presenter. How many Cisco mm -hmm. Lives have you presented at? Uh, my first Cisco Live was around 2006. Great, great, excellent. So mm -hmm. perhaps you've seen, uh, seen some of his work. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I know you've uh, put some, some stuff together for, for us. Why don't we just jump right into that? Yep. And uh, if it's okay, I'm just going to kind of hang out here and, and uh, learn with the rest of, every, uh, with the rest of everyone else. Outstanding. Thanks. So this is, um, this is a, a session that I run, as, as Jason said, at Cisco Live, really trying to focus on, on the fundamentals of RF. You know, everyone's used to using wireless, but I find that there's a lot of confusion on, on how it actually works, right? I mean, how do we get these RF signals in the air and all of a sudden I've got, you know, YouTube video uh, on cats and stuff coming on my phone. How, how hard could it be? There's no wires. <laughs> exactly. Uh, so that's what this is about, really trying to understand how does this work. And I uh, thought I'd open up one of my favorite uh, quotes from Arthur C. Clarke. Uh, Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, and it's important to recognize, right? There's fundamental scientific reasons why you must sacrifice a goat in order to make your wireless network work. Um, no, that's not true, right? It's based on scientific principles, but I think why wireless is so interesting is because there's a bit of art to the science in how we design uh, these networks, and that's, again, kind of what we're going to go on here. What's the science, and then where does the art uh, come into that? So the idea is RF fundamentals. And um, I've been using this image to kind of get across how we think about RF for a while. Um, think about throwing a rock, ripples in a pond, those ripples expanding out. That's RF signals, the energy expanding out. And of course, the amplitude, the, the size of those ripples decrease as they get further away from the epicenter, and that's the decrease in energy as they go. So as we kind of talk through some of this, you know, maybe have that image in your head you know, as we think about how does RF propagate. Now, what is RF anyway, right? So what we're talking about is electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so RF is just one element of that. We talk about microwaves as well as radio waves. Microwaves great for making popcorn and interfering with your 2.4 gig network, of course. Um, but light is also electromagnetic radiation. Everything from the infrared down to ultraviolet. And I find that's a really good way to think about how uh, different uh, electromagnetic radiation at different frequencies propagates. So light obviously isn't going to go through a wall, right? But x-rays, when we get down to that, that'll go through the skin, but won't go through the bone. And that's how I get to do those x-ray images. So in the same way with radio waves, when I talk about my 2.4 and 5 gigahertz bands, they will have different characteristics in how they propagate and what they will go through as well. Um, and of course, we have gamma rays, which is um, really not good for anything except uh, turning into the Incredible Hulk. So don't right. mess with those. Right. Um, so radio frequency fundamentals. A couple characteristics, how we describe the signals, right? So we start with frequency and wavelength. Um, so F equals C divided by lambda. Uh, 
What is C? C is the speed of light in a vacuum. Um, and so you can see we're measuring the, the distance between the peaks in the signal. But what really kind of blows my mind in this, it's a real length, right? So when we talk about the 2.5 gigahertz band, that's 12.3 centimeters, right? Five gigahertz, six centimeters. I mean, this is not mm -hmm. some microscopic um, length, right? This is something tangible that you can understand. Measurable. Distance, yeah. Exactly. Uh, we also talk about the amplitude, which I always think about in terms of the volume of the signal. And then we can talk about phase. So how does that signal shift in time? Okay? Now, uh, when we talk about signal strength, uh, we'll be looking at things like the gain and the amplification. And we also talk about losses and attenuation of the signal. Now we look at this in terms of the wave propagation. So remember those ripples in the pond, how that is propagating in space. So there's attenuation of the signal. So I actually have to put that signal from my radio through a cable to the antenna, and there's going to be loss over that cable. That's attenuation. And then there's free space path loss, right? That as the ripples in the pond decrease. I almost like to think of it almost like friction. Obviously, it's not friction, but that's, you know, you're looking at how there's a decrease uh, in the energy. We'll also talk about things like reflection and absorption of the signal and the impacts that has. So, I was talking about how that free space path loss, right? And what we're really looking at here, it's not friction, um, but we talk about the inverse square law. So, the idea is it's the same energy, but it's spread out over a larger area as it moves out. So think about when you blow up a balloon, right? And how the rubber of the balloon gets thinner and thinner the more air you put into it. Exact same principle. Now, when we look at how am I going to measure this, we talk about what I like to call RF mag mathematics. And the idea is that we're measuring things in decibels. And what's a decibel? It's just a logarithmic ratio. A ratio between values, voltages, power, gains, and losses. And Given that it's logarithmic, it gives me some nice easy things. I can add gains and I can subtract losses. So dBm, which we often see when we're doing site surveys, what is that? It's really just a power measurement relative to one milliwatt, right? Because it's a ratio. When we're talking about antennas and antenna gain, we typically talk about it in terms of dBi. What's dBi? Well, it's the forward gain of the antenna as compared to an isotropic antenna. What's an isotropic antenna? It's a great question. Great question. An isotropic antenna is a theoretically perfect antenna. We actually can't have a perfect antenna that radiates evenly out um, everywhere. That's what that's going to be. Kind of like about. a sphere, like a beach ball. Exactly. So I'm measuring against what would be the perfect antenna if I could create it, which I can't. Okay? Now, what becomes really important when we're designing wireless networks is interference and signal -to noise ratio. So any RF signal that I don't care about really is interference. That means another access point that's not part of my network, right? Because that's not signal I care about, right? right? Okay. So what we do is we look at the idea of signal to noise ratio. And it's a ratio. So given it's a ratio, we measure it in decibels. Decibels. <laughs> And so what is signal strength? Signal strength is going to be a result of my transmit power, how loud can I talk, and receive sensitivity, how well can I hear you. Right? And so this is really the secret to wireless. It's as simple as this. I have two levers. You can increase the signal, and you can decrease the noise. That's it. If I can't do one of those two things, I'm not going to get a good quality wireless network experience. And so when you look at all the different capabilities that companies like Cisco build into our wireless network solutions, they're actually focused on those two things. When you look at what we're doing in the standards and some of the things we're going to talk about here, they're all focused on those two things. So if you take away nothing except that, you've got the, the core of so, so how can, this works. We can stop listening now. Perfect. Yes, excellent. <laughs> so talk a little bit about how we design antennas. Because this is really looking at how am I going to get the wireless coverage out in my area. So the most fundamental uh, antenna we talk about is the omnidirectional antenna, right? So we're, we're sending out the signal in all directions. Um, and the way we kind of visualize this is 
with our azimuth and our elevation plane diagrams, right? So here we're looking at the um, at sort of the horizontal plane, and so I can see that I'm basically sending out the signal in 360 degrees, so it's going out entirely. But on the vertical plane, you can see here, right? And so it's actually not a big beach ball like you described before when I've got my omnidirectional antenna. I've got focus of the energy coming out perpendicular to that, and I got kind of bulbs coming out in different ways. So understanding this you know, lets you now kind of visualize how is that RF going to propagate around the room. Kind of like some weird looking pastry. Exactly like a weird looking pastry. In fact, I'm never going to think about <laughs> it quite the same way again. Thanks for that, Jason. Um, think of a light bulb, right? That's omnidirectional, but notice it's not everywhere, right? You got the plug coming down, so there's some impact in just how I build that antenna that's going to change the shape of it. Um, not really sure where we got this picture I think from. it would be better if you turn the light bulb off. Yes, good point. Um, what about patch antennas? So this is, I'm saying, I'm not going to send the energy everywhere. I'm trying to shape the energy. I'm focusing it in one particular area. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my patch antenna, which gives me this directional focus. And so that exactly what you can see here, right? Mm -hmm. I'm focusing the energy in one direction, on um, both the vertical and the horizontal. But mm -hmm. look at this one here. Right? There's a big bulb coming out the back of it. Hmm. So if I've got my patch antenna here, and then people say, well, hold on, how is it that I'm connecting to that access point on the floor above? Well, that's exactly why, because there's energy and focused energy going directly in the opposite direction. Okay? Back lobe. And so again, kind of getting a visualization of what that would be, um, you know, kind of getting that spotlight uh, focus intensity. Okay? Mm -hmm. A um, couple other things really quickly. Um, so you saw that really nice perfect circle or close to perfect. Um, everything that I do in antenna design creates compromise. So as I try to get antennas inside my access point and you know dealing with all the different electronics and having to do shielding and things like that, you're going to see I'm not going to be quite as perfect and uniform mm -hmm. in my coverage. And again, that's just the trade-offs that you try to make as you're doing different things with the antenna design. Looking at it from a different angle is, what if I want to get some really, really high gain? So here's where there's actually some pretty interesting trade-offs uh, that we make. So look at the elevation plane here. It's a little blurry, but I mean, it's really, really jagged I and mean, pretty you know, insane as opposed to the more smooth that we'd seen before. And um, best way to think of this is, so what we're, the reason for this is, in order to get the real distance, I'm trying to fill in those nulls that we have. So I've really got that focused beam. Mm -hmm. um, and so I fill in the first one, the second one's not as deep, but that comes at a cost, right? I can't get that everywhere, and that's why we get that real drastic uh, null closer in. And the impact here is those are areas of low signal. So if we had this you know, up on the tower, and you're down close to the tower, you're saying, hey, it's a high gain antenna, I should be getting a great signal, I'm right next to it, but you're actually in the shadow cast by the null. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of uh, a mag light or a flashlight, mm -hmm. and, I'm trying to, and it's not perfect light, where in the center it's bright, and then it just perfectly evenly goes out to the edges. It's more like stripes. Exactly. You know? Also, on the context of, um, of trade-offs that we have to make, um, think about a dual band antenna. If I'm designing for just one sort of frequency range, mm -hmm. I can do that really good job. When I'm trying to create coverage for both 2.4 and 5 gig, again, that's going to create trade-offs, and so my coverage is not going to be quite as good. Um, so really what falls out of this, it's really important to understand um, and see these uh, the azimuth and the elevation plane diagrams, just understand what the coverage is and that's going to help you understand uh, how your wireless coverage will be designed in the area. So before you go too far with that though, there's a lot of access points that have combined 2.4 and 5 gigahertz yep. capabilities. Do I want to separate that out? It really depends on what you're trying to do. and you know. There's a number of things that come into play. One that I find quite often in office space is um, people don't like the external antennas everywhere, right? It makes things right. look 
pretty messy. They like a kind of clean thing just up on the ceiling top, blending in. Mm -hmm. um, when you've got a high density deployment as you would have in an office, you're going to get the coverage that you want. Um, so you're probably still okay, but that's why you know a site survey ends up becoming so important. So you can really understand, you know, do you have the coverage that you need for the requirements? Makes sense. So let's shift gears a little, right? So I've now I'm sending these signals out, um, and this is where we get into the idea of multipath propagation. So best case scenario, right? I've got this line of sight, so the signal from me going direct to you, of course. Even if it's um, directional, or more likely omnidirectional, mm -hmm. there's other elements of the signal coming out, right? I'm radiating for omni in all directions. Well, so that means that things are going to be bouncing all around. There's probably some walls and things in between, um, and then I'm going to have the, the signal's just going to be scattered and diffracted and bouncing all over the place. And because it's taking different paths to get to the receiver, in this case, my iPhone sitting over there, um, each one's taking different paths, that means it's taking different time to get there. So it's going to be out of phase. And so this is going to create a real impact when I'm trying to design this robust wireless network, right? right. And so this leads us to what we call constructive and destructive interference. So looking here at three components of effectively the same signal that I've just transmitted to you, right? And so you're listening uh, to this. And so if you look over at these top two, they've got high amplitude but they're mm -hmm. completely out of phase. Right. And so that's destructive interference. When I add them together, I actually get a decrease in the signal strength. This is how uh, Bose noise canceling headphones work, right? That's what's gonna now make it so that um, I can sit on the plane and you've got a really long trip ahead of you. I do, <laughs> I do. But look at the bottom two here, right? These ones I've got, one, the bottom one has very low amplitude, but mm -hmm. it's completely in phase. And so when I add those together, I actually get a better quality signal than the top two, even though both of those are starting out with a much stronger signal, okay? Constructive versus destructive interference. Now, do you remember this access point? I do remember that access point, the AP1200. Yeah, that's a, exactly, that's a 1240. Yes, you're right. That's great, it was a test. Great job, <laughs> you passed. So 1240. Um, and what we used to do back then was what we called antenna diversity, right? So the idea is, I'm listening, I see this, mm -hmm. and I say, oh, I get a better quality signal on that one. That's the one that I'm going to use. One or the other. Exactly. So I had to pick where I'm listening from. And the way I always think about that is, remember when you were a kid and you actually used to listen to the radio because no one listens to the radio anymore, right? right? And, you know, you'd be driving and you get to the, the red light and all of a sudden it would go to static and so you take your foot a little off the brake and you'd inch a little forward and all of a sudden you get the signal? Yeah. That's antenna diversity. I've moved the antenna on my car in space which ties to the band width, right? And now I'm actually get able to get the, the signal better, okay? Antenna diversity. We don't do that anymore. What do we do? This is where we now come into MIMO. Multiple input, multiple output. Okay, the first piece of this is diversity combining, okay? Same signals that we had before, right? Mm -hmm. What was the problem? The problem was that middle one was out of phase. Right. If I can correct for that phase shift, mm -hmm. and now when I receive it, now I get an increase in the energy across all the signals that I get. And it looks like a stronger signal. A much better quality signal. Now remember when I showed you that picture and the signal's bouncing all over the place, right? Think about that, that's like a good thing, right? I've got signals bouncing around the corners. Mm -hmm. So this is all about how do I take advantage of multipath, make it something that's working to my benefit, as opposed to in the older technologies where it was actually uh, creating um, a decrease in the signal quality. So let me tell you what I just learned. With antenna diversity, multipath is destructive, but with MIMO, it can actually be constructive. Exactly. See, Spot I, can on. I can learn more stuff every day. Do you remember what that model number was? AP1250. All right. <laughs> so just kind of giving you a bit of the, the detail. So I mean, these are all those different signals, and you can see that black line where I'm now getting that combined effect, right? So that's the receive side of what we do with, uh, with MIMO. 
We also can play some tricks on the transmit side, mm -hmm. okay? So remember those ripples in the pond, all right? So instead of throwing one rock, I'm gonna throw two rocks, okay? Where those ripples intersect, I get an increase in energy. So the trick is, how do I get that to where the device is? So if I could just get, can you just move over just, just perfect, right, okay. right there. Obviously I can't have that be the way that I'm gonna make this work. So instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna steer the beams so that I can get that increase in energy where you are, okay? So how does this, that happen? This is what we call explicit transmit beamforming. And the explicit bit means you're gonna tell me a little bit so that I have a, a clue as to how I'm gonna steer those beams to get that increase in energy. Now, this actually was first looked at from an 802.11n to 11N perspective. The problem was that there were a couple different ways that it could be done, and no one could agree on which way they were gonna do it, and so really we didn't see this used at all. Hmm. Um, Cisco actually did something uh, called implicit transmit beamforming. So instead of you having to do something as a client and telling me what you're doing, right. um, I'm actually going to get information from uh, the OFDM uh, modulation, which we'll cover in a little bit. Okay. The point is, just by talking per the standard as you should be, I'm going to be able to figure out how to do that beam steering. The benefit of this was it works for any of the OFDM uh, protocols. So back to 11N, all the way to 11AC that we have now. Now in 11AC, um, we actually got our act together from a protocol side, and you'll actually see uh, the transmit beamforming being in use across most clients. Mm -hmm. But in environments where there's legacy, you know that's where that implicit transmit beamforming really worked. Um, any idea why we called it client link? Tell Trans me why. You, you can't trademark implicit transmit beamforming. So. <laughs> so the marketing guys got involved. Exactly. There were some exactly. meetings, client link. And we end up with client link. Excellent. That's kind of what I expected you were going to say <laughs> anyway, but I thought that there would be something more interesting. <laughs> Turns out there wasn't. There wasn't. <laughs> um, so receive, transmit. The last trick that we play um, with MIMO is what's called spatial multiplexing. Mm -hmm. So I've got these different uh, transmitters, right? So instead of just sending uh, the message through you know, one set of those or combined set, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use my different transmitters to send different parts of the message, multiplexing, right? So obviously this gives me a, a, a doubling effect depending on how many spatial streams I add uh, mm -hmm. to the data that I can get through uh, and send to you. So that's how I see an increase in that bandwidth, okay? Great, so spatial streams. Exactly. allows me to, if I have one spatial stream, it's kind of old school, I'm just connecting to you. Yep. Multiple spatial streams, I'm actually talking to you. Twice as fast. Twice as fast. Two different antennas. Exactly. Right. Um, now the trick here is both sides have to be capable of the same number. So my iPhone only supports one spatial stream. It doesn't matter that you can support two or three, you're just going to talk to me at one spatial stream. Right? Okay. Good clue. Now, this is how we're getting signals out. But that last bit is really looking at, oh, I don't want to send you an RF signal, I want to send you data. Right. How do I get data into this RF signal? Modulation. Modulation. That's where digital modulation comes into play. Right. Now, it's going to get a little scary here, so I need you to just stay with me. We might go a little deep, but then we'll pull back up really quick. Okay. All right? I'm okay. With you. I'm with you. I got my carrier signal. Okay. Okay. There's three basic methods that I can tweak that signal to get data, digital data, into an analog signal. All right. I can modulate the amplitude, modulate the frequency, and I can modulate the phase. All right, so simplest one, QPSK, quadrature phase shift keying. Each shift, phase shift, represents two bits. So here I can encode zero, one, two, and three. Okay, simple. We also have quadrature amplitude modulation, QAM. And this is what we typically are using from a dot 11 perspective. Mm -hmm. So the symbols are actually a combination of amplitude and phase, mm -hmm. all right? And this is gonna give me, as a big words, we like to say high spectral efficiency, which is a really fancy way of saying, lets me cram more bits into the signal. Perfect. Right? But that last bullet point is important. It can be difficult to demodulate in the presence of noise. So remember okay. that signal-noise ratio piece. Clean signal. 
Exactly. So I've got to have a really good quality signal in order to make sense of that data. Got it. Now, the other piece, this is what we were talking about before, OFDM, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. So the idea here is I'm going to combine modulation and multiplexing as a way, again, to cram more bits into the signal. So the idea here is my transmission channel, I'm going to divide into sub-channels or sub-carriers. Okay? And it kind of looks like um, the cover for Dark Side of the Moon, strangely enough. Um, animated. I think, uh, and animated. Um, I, liked, I think that prism effect kind of helps visualize what we are. So that white light is made up of all the different colors. Remember at the beginning, those colors have individual frequencies. So that's the idea. I'm kind of splitting this out. Mm -hmm. Why do we call it orthogonal? Because all those subcarriers are at 90 degree angles, so they don't interfere with one another. And then the idea is for each one of these subcarriers, I'll use QPSK or QAM. Okay? So again, what this is really all about is how do I shove more bits into the signal? Okay? Now, what does that mean? So here we are at four qualm, right? Okay. Encoding four, four values, two bits, zero, one, two, and three. Okay? Mm -hmm. And this is what we call a constellation diagram. Now, on the receive side, this is what I'm hearing. These are all the bits of data ultimately. And they're in groupings, right? So I can see that's a zero, that's a one, that's a two, and that's a three. Right? Signal to noise ratio of 10. This is at a signal to noise ratio of six. It's a lot harder to figure out the groupings now, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So what, what do you think I'm looking at here? That's a drop packet, because you <laughs> don't know, right? Perfect. And so this is the point. If I don't have the right signal noise ratio, I can't demodulate it. Therefore, I don't have any data. Right. All right. So you don't care about 4QAM, because that's like Boring. no data rate. Boring. You don't even care about 64QAM, because that's what we did with 11N. Right. This is 256QAM, which we're doing with 11AC. Okay. okay. Think of the signal noise ratio I need for that. And in fact, we can calculate it. There is a direct rate uh, relationship between the modulation scheme and, and signal, signal noise rate. ratio. It's the go to mcsindex.com and we got all this stuff. And so here you go. These ones in the green, that's my 256 qualm, right? So I've got to have good signal noise ratio. If I don't have it, I'm throttling back the modulation scheme, which is throttling back my data rate. Well, based on the MCS nines mm -hmm. or green, I think MCS bigger number is better. What does that mean? So that is then signal noise ratio. I need better quality signal. And so the nine, you mean oh the the MCS. modulation coding scheme. So that those will correspond to the uh, modulation scheme that I am using. Um, and you'll also th see things that then tie that into number of spatial streams. And ultimately, out of these tables, I'll say, this is the data at. rate that I'm getting. So signal to noise ratio 50 is like you're holding the access point in your hands right next to your iPhone. That's pretty close, right? Uh, it's not. It's going to be a normal deployment. I get my good data rates. But what it really is, remember, signal and noise. Mm -hmm. So I would need to, to hold clean. it in my hand if there's lots of noise around. But if okay. I have a good, clean environment, now I'm going to get it. Okay. Also okay. remember distance because of the inverse square law. Yeah. So I might have good, clean signal, but I'm very far away. Mm -hmm. So my signal strength is decreased. Okay. Great. So it all plays a role into the data rate that I'm going to get. Mm -hmm. Okay. A couple other things here. Um, the idea of transmit and receive diversity, right? And so this is interesting when you look at the idea of how many antennas, transmitters, and receivers I have in my system. Mm -hmm. uh, so on the top, we basically have our 3700, right. um, which is a, a 4 by 4 system, but we've turned off one of the transmitters. Okay. And so what you can see here is my coverage is pretty spotty. All right? You can see it's much cleaner when I look down at the 4 by 4 and so the idea here is that um, that extra transmitter, the transmit diversity, 
means that I can get that better quality signal to you, which allows you then to maintain that higher data rate. And they're all used together, right? Exactly. So I've heard uh, multiple input, multiple output. It's, it's more ears to hear with, more mouths to speak with. And I'm thinking uh, about a time when I was in the woods and I heard a mm -hmm. sound and my ears, both hearing that, mm -hmm but hearing it different ways and allowing myself, allowing my brain to triangulate where yep. the signal came from. Got it. Now the same holds on the receive side. Okay, so what we think about here is, remember that idea of the spatial streams, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say I've got four transmitters and receivers. Why wouldn't I do four spatial streams? Well, the reason is then I'm gonna lose that ability for the transmit and receive diversity. And so what's interesting is if you try to do that, what you find is you actually get just the same overall data rate as if I did three spatial streams because I'm going to constantly drop packets. I'm going to have to throttle back. And so here you can see with four by four, I'm majority sending three and two, but I'm also constantly changing. So when I change, that means I effectively drop the packet, which means I have to retransmit that packet. So my spectral efficiency is, is quite low now. Even though the bandwidth is high, I'm not actually sending a bunch of data through. Whereas when I do three by three, I get to take advantage of the transmit and receive diversity. Now it's pretty clean. The majority of them, yes, it's two spatial streams in this scenario, but I'm getting that. This seems like a really important point to make mm -hmm. because I've seen a lot of data sheets including our own, mm. that try to say, oh, four by four and bigger numbers yeah. seem to be maybe equated with better, better whatever. But this maybe goes against that. So how do you find the happy medium? Is there, I mean, You is always that, just want that is one that, that, extra that antenna. Right? I need the diversity. So think it's an N plus one sort of scenario, really right. is what we're, what we're trying to do. Um, I see a bunch of tenders that come out and say, we want four spatial streams because it's got four antennas and the standard says I can have it. All right, well, but you're not going to get anything useful out of it. So what's the point? And, that, and, and, and so that's your point. There are four antennas, but we get a quite a bit more efficiency if we use them in a three by three, three spatial stream type of uh, deployment. So using that fourth antenna to give me the diversity. Yeah. All right. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. So a couple other tricks that we play trying to increase bandwidth. So we start with our 20 megahertz channel, mm -hmm. but now we can do channel bonding. Mm -hmm. So now I get my 40 megahertz channel. Interesting, we've got a bit of reserved space to prevent overlap. So I actually yeah. get a bit more than a doubling effect. Mm -hmm. And then with uh, 8 to 11 AC, we went to 80 megahertz channel. Right, so now, now all, ch all channels, 2.4 and 5, are all 20 megahertz wide. Yeah. Right? So in 5 gigahertz, I can see this totally makes a lot of sense. In 2.4, I've got three You're, you're way ahead channel. of me. Oh. You're way ahead of me. That's awesome. That's exactly where we're heading on this. Good. Here's something I prepared earlier. <laughs> Just because I asked this question? <laughs> exactly. Awesome. So 2.4, 1, 6, and 11. I always got the question in the early days, why do I only have three usable channels? This makes it really easy to understand because I can't cram anything else in, right? That's it. I don't want to overlap because that is interference, okay? So the 2.4 gig band really isn't that useful to me from a wireless perspective because I only have those three uh, channels. 5 gig is pretty different, right? I got a lot more space to play with, mm -hmm. and so now you can also see in terms of my channel bonding, right? So I got two 160 megahertz wide channels that I can use, which isn't that much still, but for specialized scenarios, maybe that makes sense. Now, when I say you have two, I mean you in the US, because in Australia, where I live, we can't use those weather radar channels. So you can see here, that's taken out that, so I only have that one. One non-overlapping channel. Exactly. Seems not very scalable. Well, it just goes to available bandwidth. This is why the telcos are paying so much money for licensed spectrum mm -hmm. to have the bandwidth to get the data coverage. Um, 
So this is the unlicensed spectrum that everybody has access to. So we need to make do with the spectrum that we have available. And so what that means is just because I can have 160 megahertz channels doesn't mean that I'm always going to use them. And even if I've got, say, a bunch of 80 that you can see here, well, what if I have interference, say, just on that channel? So the idea is what we try to look at doing, and this is something that we do on the Cisco side, is have dynamic bandwidth allocation. So if I know that this channel just is no good, well, then it's better to have a 40 meg channel there and an 80 over there rather than actually have interference on my 80 megahertz channel. Yes, I cram more data through, but because That's of the interference, cleaner. I'll actually be throttling down the data rate. Let's see, that makes sense to me because I'm learning. Uh, now, I have a couple of questions for yep. you on this, right? So I, I noticed that there's there's a grouping of channels called Uni1, and then there's Uni2, and then there's this other space. I see Uni3 is way over there, yep. and then we call Uni2 extra or extended. Uh, and then I also see uh, channels 65 through 99 mm -hmm. are missing. Looks like there's a few channels over here. Mm -hmm. So what's up with that? Are those going to be new channels? Mm -hmm. So this comes down to the allocation. So it's unlicensed spectrum, but that doesn't mean unregulated. Right. And so in the US, it's the FCC that does the regulation and say what channels uh, are available. In Australia, it's the ACMA, mm -hmm. um, and that's why we can't use these, these weather radar channels. Um, and so it really is dependent on the regulations of each individual government. There's obviously a lot of moves to get access to more um, spectrum, mm -hmm. but that's a, that's a government regulatory issue, not a technology issue. Now, another regulatory piece is that word acronym DFS. Right. right? Um, so we need to be watching out in these areas because we share that spectrum with radar. And so if we dis detect a radar event, we actually have to vacate that channel. And so here it looks like I've got all these channels at my disposal, it does. but I might lose the ability to use them periodically. In fact, we had a great example, well, it wasn't great for the customer, but a great example uh, down by uh, Circular Key, Sydney Harbor. Mm -hmm. um, we had a building, brand new building, they were gonna do a wireless only uh, office. Um, turns out all the cruise ships coming have their radar. The radar was knocking out the usable channels. And then to make matters worse, they actually had some sensors in the bathrooms to automatically turn off and on the lights. Let me guess. Radar? Uni-3 oh. band. They were causing interference in the Uni-3 band. So here's this office that was being designed for wireless only. High density probably. High too. density. And almost all our channels get wiped out. Except we're for left the with the uni, uni, uni-1 band. Just use right. uh, 2.4 gigahertz. Well, so we certainly did, and the other bit is recognizing that there's the radar detection event towards the front, you know, by the water, in the back office, and so now looking at what I'm going to do with my channel allocation, how I might mark some channels off, we were actually able to mitigate the issues and, and solve the problem. So, let me ask you a question about that, because... Uh, there's a lot of really cool magic that happens by the system, right? Um, RRM, picking the right channels, DFS, which dynamically tries to pick, a, pick something as, you know, no radars in use, we'll, we'll pick some of those channels. How much of what you described required some person who had a specific, very special knowledge yeah. set? So in general, those algorithms do a good job in a, in, let's call it a normal uh, environment. Um, when you get into those specialized and, uh, you know, not continuous uh, times like the, the radar event, because it only happens when there's a ship mm -hmm. in there, and then the ship goes away and everything's fine. Um, so there does need to be some manual tuning on those when you've got those very complex environments uh, like that. So, um, you know, the system allowed us to find what the issue was because we were able to go in and see, oh, we're getting these radar detection events. That must mean that this is now happening. And then we could go through the tools that we had and the visibility we have to figure out what's the best way to optimize uh, the system to make it work. So in that particular case, it was a mix of information that the system gave you and information that you got from specialized tools. Exactly. Gotcha. Great. Thanks. Um, 
and recognize that's you know a bit of an extreme scenario. Not okay. everybody is sitting at uh, Sydney Harbor. Yeah, it's high rent district, so. <laughs> so kind of taking a step back and kind of bringing it home. Um, you know, so we have 802.11n, um, and so with 802.11n, 2.4 and 5 gig band, 40 megahertz channels, which we really only did in the 5 gig band only for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. 64 qualm was modulation, and spatial streams, we actually supported the, from a standards perspective up to four, but only three were ultimately deployed before the transition from N to AC. So 40 megahertz channels, three spatial streams, that's where we used to see that 450 megabits, megabits number, second. right? Yep. Um, if I could only do a 20 megahertz channel, then it was obviously dropping down lower. The other piece was, remember again, it depends on the capabilities of my client. So I might have a 40 megahertz channel, but my iPhone back then only supported one spatial stream, therefore I was down at 150 megabits, okay? Now with AC, because channel bonding was gonna be so important for this, it's actually five gig only. So when you have a 8 or 11 AC access point, that 2.4 gig radio is really only doing 11N. Um, there is no AC for the 2.4 gig band. Uh, but gave us channel bonding, 80 and 160 channels. Modulation scheme up to 256 QAM, which upped our data rate. Spatial stream support for up to eight, but again, we're only seeing um, uh, access points with up to four transmit receive chains, which yes, could support four spatial streams, but as we said earlier, only makes sense to do three spatial streams. Right. right? Um, and so then we got, that's where we got our 1.3 gig data sure. rate. Mm -hmm. Now, really like this picture because it helps kind of understand the different dimensions of what I have to play with to increase my data rate. So on the one hand, I've got my spatial streams, right? And there again, we said the limitation is not just my access point, but my client, mm -hmm. okay? On the other side, we've got my channel bandwidth. Well, this comes down to what channels do I have available? both from a regulatory perspective as well as an interference perspective. And then the last piece is my uh, modulation scheme. Right. right. So from a device perspective, a client perspective, I'll be able to support all the different channel bandwidths for right. a given protocol, and I'll be able to support all the different um, modulation schemes, but that's going to be dependent on signal quality. That's going to be dependent on availability and how high density I'm going, and that's then the weak point so from nice, the client side. Nice visualization, the bigger the box, the more the data. Exactly. So I remember seeing some data sheets again mm -hmm. uh, that said 1.7 gigabits per second. Yep. Why would they do that? I, I don't see that listed on your chart. So here. that was an interesting, um, we brought up marketing uh, before. Yeah. Um, so uh, what we started to see was a bit of shift in, uh, let's call it creative numbering. It wasn't that it was wrong, but basically what they were doing was they were taking the total bandwidth for the access points 2.4 and 5 gig. Gotcha. Right? So it wasn't inaccurate and probably just needed to be spelled out what we were, were talking about. But yeah, that did create some confusion uh, at right. the time. Gotcha. Now, wave two is what brought us our 160 meg channels, but again, pretty limited, which means it can be for pretty specialized use. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you look at if I had an AP, with eight spatial streams and something else with eight spatial streams that could talk to it, and 160 megahertz channel, I mean, that's approaching 10 gig wireless, right? I mean, that's some pretty cool stuff. It's pretty when, impressive. When you think about, you know, that we were starting with one megabit for 802.11, not even 11B, yeah. 11, um, we've come a, a long way. Um, and at a faster rate, uh, in some ways then uh, if you think of the length of time for wired ethernet, right? For sure. Now the real interesting piece though that came with wave two uh, is what's called multi-user MIMO. And this is where, you know, the one real thing that really kept bugging us was spatial streams are awesome, but I don't get to take advantage of them because everybody's got a small handheld mobile device that we can't physically Seems cram like multiple radios into, right? right? Lost opportunity. Exactly. Wasted bandwidth, effectively. 
So that's where multi-user MIMO comes into play. The idea is I've got those different transmit receive chains, right? What if I transmit on one transmitter to you, another transmitter to there, another transmitter to there, right? Now all of a sudden it's effectively three spatial streams just not to the same uh, client device. Now this is trickier than it sounds, right? Not only do I need to focus energy at the guy that I want to talk to, but I almost want to create nulls and reduce the energy of the signal to the people that I don't want to hear it, okay? Think about what we were doing with beam steering, right? right. All that capability, all that engineering um, knowledge that we have went into how do we do a good job um, delivering that, okay? That makes a lot of sense. So really cool stuff, and that's really going to be the start of switched wireless when you think about it, right? Because wireless has always been kind of this shared like medium. A hub. Exactly. Only now I can actually have simultaneous conversations to my different devices. So this is really going to be a major area that we can build on to see improvements. So for AC Wave 2, it's just downstream, right? It's only my access point to the client. What we'll start to see is when the client can also be part of that upstream, that's where we'll get some real improvements. Mm -hmm. Which leads oh. us to kind of the future. Now I want to preface it, it, it looks bright. I want to preface this by by saying it's actually too early to talk about 11ax. Uh, and the reason it's too early is it it is far off from a from a real mainstream uh, deployment perspective. So we don't expect the standard to complete. At this point it's looking towards the very end of 2019, maybe slipping into early 2020. The Wi-Fi Alliance, as it did with AC, will probably do some early uh, certification. Um, you know, when they're going to do that, I don't know, but it's probably a little bit earlier than when the final standard. Still probably looking towards the end of uh, 2019. Okay. So again, looking backwards at what happened in the AC space, you know, we probably will see some early uh, access points and early clients pre-standard coming out. Um, despite the fact that it's you know over a year away before we actually get a real standard, so for early adopters, you know people will be starting to look at that. So with 11N and even with AC Wave One and Wave Two, mm -hmm. there were a lot of advancements in the hardware. Yeah, uh, and some of those early clients were able to take advantage of that early hardware specification mm -hmm. because it was locked in. Mm -hmm. With AC, with AX. Is that hardware specification locked in? So it's not locked in yet, um, and that's where we're not going to maybe get all the full benefits. So while there will be devices that you know will be 11AX, whether or not they can be finally standardized is a question. Um, but more to the point, you know, when you look at the development of the technology and actually getting the full benefits, think about 11AC Wave 2. It was only Wave 2 that I got the benefits of multi-user MIMO. Right. So I might get some early capabilities, but not the full benefits uh, that will come in later uh, iterations of the, of the standard. Good point. Now, that said, there's one really cool piece that's coming in AX, which I thought was worth talking about in the context of what we've already discussed. So remember we were talking about OFDM, mm -hmm. and we had our subcarriers, and Pink Floyd was playing in the background. Right. So what were we doing there? Those subcarriers, right? That's how I was shoving more bits into the into the signal. Mm -hmm. But I had to send all those subcarriers to the same client, right? To the same receiver. Well, OFDMA, which is Orthogonal Frequency Division Multiple Access, is what we're going to be doing in 11AX. And so now those subcarriers can actually go to different clients. And so now all of a sudden, I can get even a higher spatial utilization, spatial efficiency, because I might not have a ton of data all for just you. So that truck is effectively half empty, but I couldn't make use of it any other way. Hmm. So now I'm going to be able to send everything I have for you, everything I have for the other guy, and everything that I have for you know, someone else. And so again, cramming more bits into the signal, making more efficient use of that airtime. That is fascinating. I can't wait to see more. There's a lot behind this, 
Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of science behind this, and uh, I'll be interested in learning more when the time is right. But as as like we get closer, you know, there'll be a lot more coming because there's a lot more interesting capabilities uh, around 11AX. But really, I'd say 2020 is when it'll go mainstream. So plenty of life left uh, in its 11AC. A long time from now. Yeah. That's good to know. Thank you. And that's our fundamentals. Wow. Well, I appreciate you know what? your time. Uh, Mark, I really want to mm. say thanks for mm. spending the time. We're both here in Singapore, and uh, uh, I leave tonight, so I'm about to embark on a, a long journey home, and uh, you're going to be leaving here pretty soon, too, I know. Yep. Um, shorter journey for you since you're in Australia. It's because it's downhill. Yeah, it's because it's, it's, it's downhill. <laughs> I wish my jokes were as funny as that, but I wanted to say thanks for, uh, for taking the time. Uh, this is great content, and I hope I can have you back on another Wireless Tuesday. Be a pleasure. In the thanks. Thanks a lot. This has been a presentation of Cisco's Wireless Tuesday. Be sure to continue the conversation at CiscoFullBars.com, and at the top, click on the CFB Spark Community. There, you can connect with scores of like-minded wireless LAN professionals. Be sure to subscribe to the Wireless Tuesday podcast using your favorite podcast player and stay up to date by subscribing to the Wireless Tuesday newsletter at wirelesstuesday.fm. We will see you next month for an exciting episode of Wireless Tuesday.